Um, I'd, I'd like to now invite uh, Matt Vaughan up from the Karatikonis Australia. Um, now, um, you may think uh, there's uh, no expense spared here that we're, uh, we're flying people over from the other side of the world to, uh, uh, to present to us, but actually Matt is, uh, uh, Matt's living uh, uh, here at the moment, and so we took the opportunity to co-opt him onto, the, uh, onto our committee and, uh, and press gang him into uh, giving a little presentation in, uh, um, uh, of, uh, of how, uh, how kind of our... Um, um, our equivalent in Australia uh, um, runs, uh, run, runs themselves, whether there are any different issues there and uh, what we might be able to learn from, uh, uh, from a, a similar type of uh, self-help group. Thanks, Mark. Um, my name's Matt Vaughan and I'm the former Vice President of Keratoconus Australia. Um, I've had to relinquish my position as the Vice President while I'm uh, living in London. And as Mark says, I'm uh, now working with the committee over here and hopefully can add some value. Uh, my presentation today is titled Keratoconus Australia, The Story So Far. And I'll hopefully give you a good snapshot of what's happening in Australia uh, with much of the information being relevant to everybody who has keratoconus. I'm going to give you a brief rundown of how Keratoconus Australia got started, uh, what we're trying to achieve, what's involved in our day-to-day -day operations, what some of our current projects and achievements are, and uh, what we're looking to do in the future. I'll start with a bit of a personal background. Um, my brother rang me in September last year to tell me he was getting married, and then I had to be in Scotland for the wedding in November. So I figured this was going to fly halfway around the world, then I may as well stay for a while, so I got myself a UK working visa. I then figured if I was going to be in this part of the world, it'd be good, um, it would be good to meet up with the people from Keratoconus Group. So I initially emailed Anne, and here I am. Um, hopefully my being here will allow Keratoconus Australia and Keratoconus Group to uh, learn some things of each other, to share some information which can hopefully be of mutual benefit. I'm sure that any affiliation we have can only be positive for both organisations. Now, I was diagnosed about 10 years ago. Um, I had a graft in 2001, which has been successful thus far, although I've gone through many lenses. Uh, my interest in the disease and how it could be dealt with stemmed primarily from my university days when I seriously struggled with the cost of my contact lenses. As you know, as a student, you're not overly rich. Um, uh, okay, now we'll go into a bit of uh, Keratoconus Australia history. Uh, we got off the ground thanks to an optometrist in Melbourne called Richard Voile. He was a former president of the Optometrist Association in Australia and through his work there he recognised the need for a group like Keratoconus Australia or KA. Um, Richard organised for all these Keratoconus patients of which I was one to meet up in a cafe one night. Uh, there was about 20 people at that original meeting where Keratoconus Australia was born. Uh, the original, that was in mid-99. Uh, the original committee consists of myself and about six or seven others, of which three are still very much involved. Uh, the, the association was registered in 2000 with the objectives that you can see here. Another th uh, other things that we're looking to do on top of these um, is assisting people to find optometrists and ophthalmologists slash corneal surgeons experienced in treating keratoconus. I found it interesting hearing before that you guys don't have lists and don't provide that. It's something at, at home we think is very, very important and we've been adamant about making sure that we're getting people to the right, pe to the right um, optometrists, to the, to the contact lens practitioners who know what they're doing to ensure that you know, people's conditions don't suffer because they're dealing with um, practitioners who might not have the required experience to get it right. Uh, we're helping to develop a network of support groups throughout Australia. We're publishing a regular newsletter, with, an electronic newsletter with information on a wide range of issues affecting people with keratoconus. Um, our, f our first printed copy has come out recently and there's, there's copies out on the table out there. Um, we're acting as a representative group for keratoconus patients to improve health rebates for treatments, um, including contact lenses, solutions and glasses, and corneal surgery, and to obtain higher funding for local research into the condition. I'll talk a fair bit about this, the rebate issue uh, a bit later. Uh, we're developing a national registry and database on keratoconus. Patients are designed to assist in networking individuals and groups within Australia and to form a basis for future research. Uh, we're supporting efforts to increase organ donations and in particular reduce waiting times for corneal grafts, which we also feel is extremely important. Um, now I'll talk about some of, the, uh, some of our practical operations. Um, we have a committee of five, of which four are office bearers, being the President, Vice President, Treasurer and Secretary. We meet once every three weeks, although that's not 
set in stone. It's sometimes more, sometimes less, depending on what's happening. At those meetings, the, the four office bearers provide reports of their activities, and we obviously keep a record of everything we've done and what we've done and what we're doing. Um, we have a legal firm who walks, works pro bono for us um, and helps set, set us up in terms of becoming a not-for-profit association, or I think we're technically a public benevolent institution. Um, the law firm also helps us write our constitution and advise us on various issues like what we cannot, can and cannot say as part of our support work. On average, we respond to about 20, 25 emails per week and receive about five to 10 phone calls. These are made up of three fairly distinct groups, which I'm sure is a like situation here. People wanting general information, people wanting medical information or advice. Uh, this is something we're very adamant about making sure any medical emails get forwarded to our, we've got two or three optometrists who work closely with us who answer our medical questions. So we always ensure qualified people answer those questions, which we think is important. Um, and I mean, the most common, common people getting in contact with us are people simply wanting support um, and wanting to talk to someone about, uh, with keratoconus. Now I've found, I've, I've been dealing with the phone calls the last couple of years and I've found that the calls really last for less than 45 minutes and people are amazingly happy to speak to someone else with keratoconus who can relate to their concerns and their fears. I'm sure there'd be similarities over here um, in terms of being a reference point for people simply want to get together and talk, which is what we're doing here today. Okay, uh, we try to have a seminar that looks into issues relating to keratoconus on a quarterly basis, but we haven't always been able to do four a year. Um, the overhead shows the titles of some of our recent seminars, uh, which we try to give clever names to. <laughs> you know, our president, Larry, is a journalist and he's usually pretty creative with his word plays. You'll notice our newsletter is called KA Contact. Um, we've found that people attend these events just as much for the ability to laze with each other and swap stories as they do for the content of the lecture, which is usually done by an eye care professional. Um, and we'll, generally our format will be to have one eye care professional and one um, sort of a patient story. Um, the seminars are free and we found that we generally get enough donations to cover the cost of them. Uh, we have an arrangement to get free room hire at the Victorian Optometry College uh, where the seminars are held and we found that being able to avoid room costs is a great way to keep overheads down. And things like that, it's something our secretary works very hard on and pushes very hard to a lot of these places to um, you know, basically support us because we're working voluntary, we're, we're basically a charity. So we found it's important to, you know, um, to try and do as much as you can in terms of keeping costs down, um, which makes it, makes it sort of better for everyone and makes it a lot easier for us to, to function. Um, in regard to donations, we have deductible gift recipient status, so all our donations are tax deductible, which is very important. We've thought about charging a membership fee, but I've decided it's much better to have free membership. Uh, we very strongly encourage people to donate, and because we're fairly financially secure at the moment, um, we don't have the, uh, the need for the extra revenue that comes through a membership fee. Generally, we've found that there is an encouraging amount of goodwill within the Curitaconus community, and that um, people who don't donate are usually covered by people who are very generous. Um, in regard to our funding, as I've said, we're in a fairly stable position at the moment due to some uh, very generous donations and implementations of various funding schemes. Uh, we also sell DVDs which are available from our website. The site's keratoconus.asn.au and the DVDs are basically uh, all our, all our um, seminars that we've put on, we've recorded, so people who can't get there obviously can, and can watch these DVDs and and um, learn from what's been talked about. Uh, the, they're very reasonably priced at 35 Australian dollars, which is about 14 pounds. So it's not so much about making money off them, it's more about having them there as, as a record of what we've done and, um, and as something that people can easily sort of get their hands on and um, to view. Um, I think like over here, I mean, we're very Melbourne-centric in what we do. So people who live in other cities or in country Victoria find it difficult to get to the seminars. So we find that that's sort of important to provide that service. Now in terms of our uh, practical day-to-day -day running of the association, by far our biggest problem is finding volunteers. Um, in fact, we found this to be the biggest hurdle in our development thus far. We currently provide the US group's pamphlet to our new members as part of a membership pack that is very similar to the ones that you guys provide here. Um, we've developed our own booklet which is ready to be distributed to all the optometrists in Australia, but have realised that there is no way we could cope with the extra demand once this was released. So 
that's a project that we've had to shelve just because we just haven't got the manpower to deal with the um, the um, the requests that had sort of come after people have sort of seen that. Um, uh, so until yeah, until we get more volunteers, there's basically just no way we can cope with a lot of the extra man that would come from doing these other projects. And hopefully, I can get some good advice or information over here on how to um, get people uh, get people to get involved with these things. Um, these are just some of the issues associated with the running of KA. What I've said really only touches the surface. And I know our president, Larry Kornhauser, generally puts in a good 15 to 20 hours some weeks just to keep things running smoothly. Uh, this is on top of a full-time job and a young family, so these efforts really need to be acknowledged. Our, sec our secretary, Belinda Serratelli, has also worked for countless hours on various projects and puts up with us taking over her living room every three weeks for our meetings. OK, now look at some of the achievements we've made. Uh, we currently have over 600 members and counting. Um, we've had, I think it's about 14 successful seminars um, with an average of 50, 60 people at each event. Um, our annual Christmas barbecue has proven to be very popular. Uh, we, have a good, we feel we have a good quality website which has, helped, which has proven to be a necessity in this day and age really. Um, it's also helped a lot through people registering online for membership and being able to use the discussion forums uh, and, and just to generally get information which I'm sure is very similar here. Uh, we find that young people especially take advantage of the website and it's a good place to start when referring people for general information just after they get in contact with us if they haven't already seen it. Now something significant which we've recently done is that um, myself and the President Larry Kornhauser spoke at the Australian Corneal Surgeons Seminar in Melbourne. Uh, we actually spoke with a renowned ophthalmologist and ethicist on the idea of informed consent versus thera therapeutic privilege, which is something that John was um, um, talking about or um, hinting at talking about a bit earlier. Um, now the idea of therapeutic privilege versus informed consent um, is looking at the question of whether ophthalmologists should be dictating the process surrounding corneal grafts um, or whether patients should be receiving as much information as they possibly can from ophthalmologists and, optomo and optometrists um, and that they make decisions based on the information. And I found it, it was good to hear what John said which is basically saying that yeah it's very important to try and give people as much information and allow them to make decisions because it is at the end of the day, it's, it's them. It's not the surgeon that's um, going through the procedure. Um, a, a big part of this, talking about this and getting involved in this stuff was we heard a lot, well not a lot, but we, we heard several cases about people being immediately referred to graphs when, when not all contact lens options have been exhausted. And we feel it's very important that that shouldn't happen. Now, our speaking at the seminar helped to increase awareness of KA to many of the ophthalmologists and was generally well received. There were some who were sceptical about what our place should be, but we seem to do a good job of convincing the ophthalmologists that we sort of, we will add value to the process by disseminating information for people surrounding the corneal grass rather than sort of making life harder for them. As part of our support, we too often heard people complain that they were treated as an eye, not a person by the ophthalmologists. Um, after my graft, I remember being very frustrated when going back to checkups when the ophthalmologist will say, you know, it looks great, no problem, see you later, 10 seconds. Um, trying to explain to him that I still had images of a scalpel sort of cutting into my eye because the operation was done under a local anaesthetic seemed to fall on deaf ears. Things like better explaining the consequences of having a graft done under a local rather than general anaesthetic I think provides a good example of the sorts of issues we feel need to be better considered by ophthalmologists and the types of things we're trying to get through to the ophthalmologists because we're hearing about them reasonably consistently through, um, through our members. Um, now a bit about corneal donation. Um, last year I spent a day in the eye and ear hospital in Melbourne providing information on corneal donation. We strongly advise any members and their families to especially think about donating their corneas. I'm sure it's a similar situation in the UK as it is in Australia where people, um, people are happy to be organ don donors but are generally reluctant to donate their corneas for various reasons. Our work in trying to increase the, the donation obviously fits in closely with our objective of reducing corneal transplant waiting times. Uh, another significant achievement that I think we've done is we've worked with the Optometrist Association in ensuring that uh, optometrists receive four continuing education points for attending our seminars. Now I would assume there's a similar policy in practice over here where every year optometrists need to accrue a certain amount of points um, a certain amount of points from approved activities external to their day-to-day -day jobs. And becoming one of these accredited events 
uh, for optometrists has made it much easier for us to get a good optometric presence um, at our seminars, and it's obviously great for discussion times. It's also proved to be very beneficial for the optometrists, many of whom who've commented um, on how now that they've been to these seminars, they do have a much better insight into some of the issues associated with having keratoconus than they previously did. Uh, now I'd like to talk about some of our current projects. Our main ongoing project and our main, uh, one of the big things that I've driven um, in the last two or three years is getting rebates from private health insurers or getting realistic rebates from private health insurers for RGP lenses. Um, in Australia, the maximum rebate from a private health insurer is $180 a year for contact lenses. Because keratoconus is not recognised as a disability, the funds who are subsidised by the federal government consider contacts wear, contact lens wear to be cos cosmetic rather than me uh, medical. This means the most I can get back from private insurers is $180 a year. Now, since leaving Australia in November, I've lost four lenses at a cost to me of $1,200, which is about £500. Uh, we're trying to get the insurers to provide ancillary packages where people can pay higher premiums and in turn get more realistic rebates for their lenses. Now I'm going to read an article that I actually wrote and I had published in the Australian Optometry newspaper recently because I think it does a good job of uh, sort of articulating this issue and it also talks about some statistics from a survey we recently did on our members. Okay. Now, the, the article's titled Keratoconus Towards Fairer Rebates on Contact Lenses. Most people who wear contact lenses for keratoconus are distinctly disadvantaged by current Medicare, which is the Australian NHS, basically, and private health insurance policies. They now in recognition of their potentially disabling eye disease, and in particular that contact lenses worn to correct their vision are medical, not cosmetic devices. Those with rigid gas permeable lenses require them to do the most basic things like study, work, drive and even care for themselves and their families and to pay taxes. People denied access to RGPs properly adapted and fitted for their condition risk becoming handicapped or disabled by poor vision. The cost to taxpayers of subsidising extra services to assist these otherwise healthy people will simply place further unnecessary strain on Australia's already overstretched healthcare budget. The problem was highlighted in a recent survey of 150 uh, Keratoconus Australia members. Uh, around 75% of the survey respondents used some form of contact lens for visual correction, with over 60% of them specifically requiring RGPs to gain any useful vision. Now these people are spending uh, annually on average $272 on lenses plus another $285 on cleaning solutions and disinfectants and so on. Um, that's a total of $557 and 94% of these people feel that they have to spend that to gain usable, usable vision um, to do the things that I mentioned before. Uh, these people outlay an average of $1,338 per year on private health insurance, yet Australia's 40-odd insurers provide only around $180 per year in rebates for optometric items. Even then, the average rebate is only $50 to $60 per RGP lens. At, a cost of two, at an average cost of $272 per RGP lens, a patient would need to spend some $900 um, annually on lenses to receive the full $180 rebate. Um, incredibly, the funds generally refund more for a pair of simple reading glasses and a pair of RGPs for keratoconus. Not surprisingly, 92% of our respond respondents are not satisfied with the current private health insurance rebates for RGPs for keratoconus. The situation is unacceptable and stems largely from a lack of recognition that the RGPs are an essential medical device used in restoring usable vision to keratoconus patients. Medicare defines those with keratoconus by the fact that they can gain better vision with contact lenses rather than with glasses. So why don't the private health insurers who are subsidised by the same government that runs Medicare provide rebates that are relevant to the cost of these lenses? If the private health funds, um, the private health funds defended their rebate policies by shifting the blame for the higher cost of RGPs for keratoconus onto the optometrists, and this is an interesting issue that we're, we're dealing with at home, they claim that the prices of $250 to $350 per lens do not represent the actual cost of the RGPs but are inflated by the markup added by their contact lens fitter. The optometrists respond that these markups are necessary because of low schedule fees paid by Medicare. That's basically the subsidy they're given by the government for the consultation. Uh, these fail to compensate them adequately for uh, often long and difficult fitting sessions required for people with moderate to severe keratoconus or have had corneal transplants. Uh, the survey also confirmed that over 40% of respondents spent more than 40 minutes in consultations for lenses. Irrespective of who is right in this debate, keratoconus patients are bearing the costs 
of bearing the cost. Ironically, the high cost of expertly fitted RGP lenses means patients may be avoiding the group of optometrists who are providing the best services due to their added costs, uh, the added costs associated with seeing them. As ill-fitting RGPs can, uh, can eventually damage the cornea, often leading to a premature corneal transplant, this behaviour may ultimately lead to higher costs for both the patient and the community. So it's an interesting, it's a situation where the, 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 probably the, the best practitioners who are charging the most because they're spending more time on the consultations, so hence they have to put a bigger markup on the lenses. These best guys are probably going to be avoided because of the extra costs associated with seeing them. And this is something obviously we, we feel is important, it needs to be recognised and it needs to be avoided because the best optometrists need to be treating, treating keratoconic patients. Um, KA believes that the Medicare item number 10924, which, which distinguishes keratoconic consultation from others, does not broadly enough define the distinction within the group of keratoconic patients. We think the Medicare should survey the keratoconus patient's specific requirements to allow a more accurate assessment of the time and cost issues involved in treating them. We then formulate fairer funding allocations within the keratoconic group and properly determine required changes in the Medicare consultation item numbers and private insurance rebate system. Uh, it may be that people with severe keratoconus and corneal graftees need to be recognised through a subsection of this 10924 or a completely new item number. The extra markups put on lenses for severely affected patients should be absorbed through more strategic funding on Medicare's behalf. Uh, this, is not, this does not necessarily imply more funding, but better targeted funding through restructuring and scaling of the schedule fee. The optometric community believes that the best way to treat most keratoconus patients is through properly fitting RGP contact lenses. Keratoconus Australia believes it is now time for optometrists to ensure that keratoconus patients receive an equitable deal on their treatment. We believe this can be achieved at little extra cost to the existing system. So that was that article, and obviously, I mean, that article highlights a lot of things, a lot of issues that we feel are important in Australia and things that we're um, sort of working towards um, making more, making better for the keratoconic um, community. It's obviously, I mean, we're talking about you know, the equivalent of the NHS, it's obviously an uphill battle. We're a small organisation, but, you know, if we can keep building members, then we'll hopefully get there eventually. Um, after, I've spoken to the guys at home recently. Apparently, we've had a, a significant spike in membership after this article was published, which is very encouraging. Um, there was actually an article written alongside that by an optometrist in Australia who's a big supporter of our group, and he was actually talking about from the optometrist perspective that a lot of our arguments, I mean, these things can happen and should happen. Uh, this guy's actually just written a follow-up on an article titled Dabblers, and it's about optometrists who are not properly qualified trying to fit RGP lenses for those with keratoconus. Um, this could be of particular interest to the optometrist and um, is available on our website, along with a lot of other information relevant to this stuff. Um, I know that, I mean, that, that particular issue is probably not relevant to the system over here. I know the system over here is different, but I think the point is that that kind of ad advocacy work and what we're trying to achieve is, um, is something we feel is important and we feel that, I mean, people with keratoconus are in such a minority that um, a lot of the time you're sort of getting the rough end of the stick in terms of the way the, s the system's set out. So I think groups like ours and groups like Keratoconus Group are really important in, in highlighting these issues and, and trying to make things better for keratoconic for people with keratoconus. Okay, now I'll look at some of our current projects. Um, okay, we, um, we've got a couple of really exciting things coming up, actually. Um, we've, we're about to assist some ophthalmologists in Melbourne to launch a study into genetics and keratoconus. Uh, these people hope to identify intergenerational keratoconus in families in which only one member has been actually diagnosed with clinical keratoconus. Uh, they hope that that will help identify the gene that passes on keratoconus, uh, which in theory is the first step to finding a cure, so it's, it's obviously very exciting, but obviously in the very initial stages at this time. We've also been approached for funding assistance from a promising new research project in Germany. Uh, three, C3-R riboflavin-UVA treatment is currently being developed in Dresden. Um, the treatment is shown to strengthen the cornea and to halt the progression of keratoconus. Now, as you can imagine, I don't actually understand the science behind all of this, but um, hopefully some of the eye care professionals today can, can maybe better explain that to us. Uh, the research is still in its very early stages at the moment, but is um, very exciting because it holds, it holds hope for arresting the progress of keratoconus. This obviously has benefits in reduced numbers suffering from vision loss and also people who have to have corneal transplants. 
All right, now looking at sort of what we want to achieve into the future, um, our number one goal is to get more volunteers. I mean, to really, to, to move forward and to be more effective in, in, in fighting the private health insurance organisations and being an advocacy group, we need more people and we need, we need dedicated people and we need, um, we, we need people with this, the kind of skills who can sort of help us along. So finding those people is a challenge and it's probably our biggest hurdle. Another thing we want to do is to um, become properly Australia-wide. As I've mentioned, our, our organisation is very sort of Melbourne-centric. That's where it started. That's where the seminars are. Um, becoming Australia-wide is obviously very closely tied in with the first objective of getting more volunteers. I mean, until we can get the people to, to help us and get people to organise events in Sydney and Brisbane, then it's very difficult for us to do. And, you know, we're, we're on a limited budget. We're a small organisation, so we can't... And we haven't got the time to be sort of flying all over the country and making this happen. Um, now, research shows that there's about 10,000 people with significant keratoconus in Australia. Based on that statistic, um, we probably have about 10% of those people as our members. If we can continue to build that percentage figure, we feel we'll have a much greater lobbying power and ability to do advocacy work on behalf of those with keratoconus. And one thing I've been thinking about lately, actually, in terms of this, this project to, to lobby the private health insurers, is that if we can get in the position where we can, say, have, you know, 1,000, 2,000 members, and we can go to these, these private health insurers and say, you know, X percentage of our members and their families will be willing to transfer to your organisation with your packages if you could sort of create ancillary package and keratoconic friendly um, packages. Then um, if we're talking about having, you know, say we've got 1,000, 2,000 members, 20, 30% of the keratoconic population in Australia, and we can sort of take those numbers to these, to these organisations, we'll feel we'll start to be taken very seriously. I mean, that's, that's, that's a lot of people, including their families. Um, so that seems the bottom line is the big factor for these, for these places. So if we, can, if we can show to them that we can, you know, we can not hurt their bottom line and we can give them more business, then I think they'll um, be more willing to start start looking, listening to some of these, some of these propositions about these, these different packages for people with keratoconus. Um, another important thing is we want, to, we want to increase, continue to increase our affiliations with various bodies such as the Optometrist Association, which we're obviously very we're affiliated with already. Um, but we're also very aware of not coming, becoming too close to any organisations. We thought about getting contact lens companies to sponsor our seminars, but um, felt that we, you know, they, we might have to sort of push their products as part of that deal, which may not necessarily be the best thing for our members who are our number one priority. Um, this is actually something we've really focused on more recently as we've begun to laze more with various bodies such as with the Victorian Optometry Association, the Corneal Bank, the Ophthalmology Group and others. Um, we refuse to sort of toe the line of any of these organisations and we, we want to make sure that our objectives are, are kept sort of mutually exclusive of theirs. I mean, we're, we're all about helping people with keratoconus. That's, that's what we're doing. We're not there to sort of toe the line of the drug companies or to toe the line of certain optometrists or ophthalmologists. We're, we're acting independently of them and we're acting for people with keratoconus. Um, eventually, one day down the track, we're hopefully going to be um, getting to a position where we can fund research into better lenses and finding potential cures for keratoconus, as you've heard we're sort of looking at at the moment, um, which, is, which is obviously, as I say, in the, in the very initial stages at this time. We are very aware this is also probably a, a long way off and that our main purpose in the medium to, to sort of long term will be to support those with keratoconus and to act as an advocacy group for them and to continue to do all the things that, we're, um, that we've been doing. Um, after being here today, I'd like to add that a long term goal for all keratoconus associations or groups like, uh, like KA and like keratoconus groups should be to do everything we can to help each other. Um, I think by sharing knowledge and good ideas, we can move closer to making life with keratoconus more bearable for everybody. Due to the size and budgets of the groups around the world, this is probably a long way off, but should be something we're all thinking about and working towards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matt, for that uh, uh, very interesting uh, talk. Now,